Good evening. Seven o'clock, so we'll get started. My name is uh, Rick Clare. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Virginia. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation of the 2019 Woodrow Lloyd Lecture. Uh, as we begin tonight's event, I would like to acknowledge our presence here at the University of Virginia on Treaty 4 lands, the territories of the Nahiwak, Ahishnapek, Dakota, Nakoda, Nakoda, and the whole of the Each winter, through the generous support of the Woodrow Lloyd Trust, the Faculty of Arts presents an annual lecture in honor of the late Woodrow Stanley Lloyd, 1913 to 1972, one of Saskatchewan's most influential public servants. Lloyd believed that all students deserved equal access to educational opportunities. As Minister of Education in the government of Tommy Douglas, he undertook a radical and at the time controversial redevelopment of Saskatchewan's education system. This included implementing Canada's first system of student loans and bursaries, an innovation that has since, of course, caught on across the country. Similarly, when he succeeded Tommy Douglas as Premier of Saskatchewan, Lloyd played a formative role in the implementation of Medicare, Canada's first public health care program. The Woodrow Lloyd Lecture Series was established in recognition of his leadership and his legacy in the areas of education and public service. The terms of reference call for the speaker to be nationally or internationally recognized, a scholar, a writer, a thinker, or an activist, and to address an issue of direct relevance to Saskatchewan. Previous speakers have included Sheila Cullen, author and Golden Mail columnist, Murray Sinclair, Canadian Senator and Chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and Pam Palmer, Professor and author of social justice, uh, sorry, author and social justice advocate. Tonight we are pleased to add award-winning author and journalist Andrew Nicoforas to our list of esteemed speakers. And I would like now to invite Dr. Emily Eaton to the platform to introduce him. Hi. I woke up this morning with a really scratchy voice. It has improved a little bit over the day, so I hope you can all hear me. Uh, my name is Emily Eaton. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies and a member of the Woodrow Lloyd Lecture Committee. And I'm really delighted tonight to introduce our speaker, Andrew Nikiforak. Andrew Nikiforak is an award-winning journalist and author who has been writing about the oil and gas industry, energy, economics, and the West for over 30 years. His work has appeared in such publications as The Walrus, Claims Canadian Business, The Globe and Mail Report on Business, Chatelet, Equinox, and Harrowsmith. I enjoy reading Andrew's work in the Taiyi, where he is on the energy beat. Nikki Fork has won multiple awards for his journalism, including seven national magazine awards and honors from the Association of Canadian Journalists. He's also the author of several books, including The Energy of Slaves, Oil and the New Servitude, and Pandemonium, Bird Flu, Mad Cow Disease, and Other Biological Plagues of the 21st Century. His book, Saboteurs, We Will Ludwig's War Against Big Oil, was awarded the Governor General's Award for Nonfiction in 2002. His 2010 book, Tar Sands, Dirty Oil and the Future of a Continent, was a national bestseller, a finalist for the Grantham Prize for Excellence in Reporting on the Environment, and received the prestigious Rachel Carson Environment Book Award. His latest book, 2015's Slick Water, Fracking and One Insider's Stand Against the World's Most Powerful Industry, is a critical examination of the legal and moral implications of fracking, 
and has received widespread acclaim, including the 2016 Science and Society Journalism Award. And these aren't even all of his books, but I don't have time to mention the others. As an independent journalist and author, Andrew Nicky Fork has emerged as a strong, <coughs> critical voice against the corporatist oil agenda, and as an advocate for informed national debate on oil and gas. For me, this is just so important, given that we live in a province and in a country where our level of debate around oil and gas has been <coughs> reduced to scaremongering, name-calling, and outright lies. Our political and civil society has been so influenced by the power of these industries that there are too, way too few courageous and independent souls out there willing to speak about the real impacts of the industry on local communities and global environments. I can speak for myself in saying that Andrew's rigorous research and vibrant exposition have kept me anchored in my own research on oil's impacts in this province. When the pervasive silence and denial emanating from government regulators and industry have made me question sometimes even my own findings and analysis, I've returned to Andrew's writings to remind myself that there is a mountain of evidence about the true nature of the oil and gas industry and its attempts to cover up its impacts while rallying workers and Canadians behind the oil economy. Tonight's lecture is entitled Pipelines and the Petrostate. He's going to be bringing his analysis to bear on the $11 billion Trans Mountain Pipeline project and he'll examine the political and economic consequences of the federal government's involvement in this costly and polarizing expansion project. And this lecture couldn't be better timed as the National Energy Board just last week reapproved for the second time the Trans Mountain Pipeline. This while conducting, concluding sorry, that the project and related marine shipping is likely to cause significant adverse environmental effects on the southern resident killer whale population on indigenous cultural use of marine and shore resources, and from the greenhouse gas emissions that will be emitted by increased marine vessel traffic. I know Andrew is going to help us shed light on how the NEB can recognize such impacts while ruling that the project is still in Canada's so-called <coughs> national interests. So please welcome Andrew Nikki Park. thank the university as well for in inviting me to come and, and give this talk, um, particularly at a period in Canadian politics where, it, where, where we hear more monologues than, than we do dialogues. And before I kind of launch into things tonight, um, and I think I've got quite a dramatic uh, series of stories to tell you, um, uh, I thought it's best to begin with a little levity. And I was reminded of a, of a story uh, about a shepherd who is taking his flock to market. And uh, a man walks up and, uh, and approaches him, and the man is very kind of jaunty and, and arrogant. And, uh, <clears throat> and he kind of just sort of says out of the blue, you know, um, I bet you one of those sheep, um, I can guess uh, how many animals are in your flock. And the shepherd sort of thought, well, this is a bit hasty. Um, but he said, you know, I've got a lot of animals here. All right, I'll get this guy. I'll, I'll take you on. He said, uh, okay, I'll, I'll take that bet. Um, and then the man pops a, a number right out of his mouth, 973. And uh, the shepherd is dumbfounded. He said, that, that's exactly the number of sheep that I have. I'm a man of my bird. Take an animal and off you go. So, just as the stranger is picking up an animal and getting ready to walk away, the shepherd thinks, now, now wait a moment, he says, let me have a chance to get even. Double or nothing, I can guess your exact occupation. The man says, why? Why, sure. So the shepherd looks at him again, eyes him from foot to head, and then he says, you're an economist 
that works at a government think tank. <laughs> and uh, amazing, says the man. He said, how could you have deduced that? And the shepherd says, you put down my dog and I'll tell you. <laughs> Now, there are a few points I think I want to make right off the bat before we get into the stories. And if you somehow fall asleep in this presentation, which I doubt you will, uh, hopefully you will remember one or two of these points. The first is that the energy, not money, makes the world go around. The global economy was founded on cheap energy, primarily cheap fossil fuels. When oil prices are high, as we all know, the economy seems to, or when oil prices are low, the economy uh, uh, grows and moves along at great speeds. But when oil prices are high, it, everything begins to slow down. So without supplies of cheap energy, there is really no such thing as economic growth. Third, the era of cheap oil began to end about 20 years ago as industries started to mine extreme resources, whether we're talking about vitamin under the boreal forest, or tight oil in shale basins, or deep sea oil in the ocean. All of these resources are extreme and difficult. They cost more to extract. And since we have become more and more dependent on these extreme resources, oil prices have grown more volatile. Fourth, Canada is probably the first so-called developed nation um, to become the world's fourth largest oil exporting nation without a strategic plan about pace, scale, risks, or savings. You know, the fundamental question, what do you do about the money? As a result, Alberta and Canada clearly now have two dramatic problems. Overproduction of a low-grade resource, at the same time, U.S. is rising production of tight oil. And no strategic plan to add more value to low-grade vitamin. Six, a North American surge in production of tight oil and heavy oil, nearly five million barrels in total, precipitated the 2014 price collapse in oil. Canadian politicians still don't have a clue. The collapse followed the longest period of unaffordable oil prices in global history, an average of 90 bucks a barrel between 2010 and 2014. The global economy struggled as oil prices reached those heights. As Canada exports more oil, it is generating less revenue not more from vitamin. Oil and gas royalties generated a revenue stream for governments of about 16.1 billion in the year 2000. Today, that figure has collapsed to 6.6 .6 billion dollars. And those are figures from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. At the same time, oil sands production has grown by 120, uh, 112% or doubled. Current revenue streams from oil and gas will not be able to pay for the industry's growing liabilities on the landscape, including inactive wells, abandoned pipelines, and old and derelict gas plants. Most multinationals from state oil to total have exited the oil sands for several rational reasons. And it's not because of US funded environmentalists. It is the high cost of extracting the resource, the growing price volatility, the global economic slowdown, what to do with the, uh, with the problem with overproduction, and not to mention carbon liabilities. Twelve. 
More pipelines might ease bottlenecks, but they will not raise global prices or end price discounts and volatility for diluted bitumen. Nor do pipelines address the need to limit greenhouse gas emissions from the oil centers. 13. The premium market for heavy oil remains the U.S. Gulf Coast. There is no Asian price lift. That's because the U.S. remains the world's largest heavy oil market. Whether you like it or not, that's the place to sell heavy crude. 14. If Canada does not limit oil exports or adopt a value-added strategy, overproduction and volatile global pricing will devastate the industry and the economy. Business 15. Is business as usual is over, and there is only one economic and political forecast that will have any reliability, and that is increased volatility on all fronts. Last point. Art Berman, a Houston analyst with a reliable forecast record, puts the situation this way. The future for oil prices and the global economy is frightening. I don't know what beast slouches towards Bethlehem, but I am willing to bet that it, it does not include more economic growth. The best path forward is to face the beast. Acknowledge the problem. Stop looking for improbable solutions and pretend energy is still cheap and find ways to live better with less. That's a Houston analyst. All right, so let's begin our story. And I'm gonna, I, my, I, I, my presentation is, is sort of a, stories within stories. It's kind of a, a Russian doll that we will be taking one piece after another. And I thought we'll start with the global context. Just a, a quick overview of, of what's going on in the globe that we need to think about before we start thinking about pipelines and, and oil export in this country. The first major political trend is that of growing economic inequality in almost every Western democratic state. And this story has only one of two endings, revolution or police state. Historically, there are only two endings from this story. The other problem we have is, is what, I love it, the academics, the way they put some of these things, they call, call this the overproduction of elites. <laughs> uh, where you have, you know, so many elites that they are in conflict all the time about how to manage the few spoils that are left. And so here we have a billionaire and a lawyer um, uh, debating the future of the United States. Um, but they really symbolize very well this growing dissension and discord uh, in national elites everywhere, not just in Canada and the United States, but in Europe. Now we have this uh, another term, again, that, that academics use, and they use this term, immiseration. And what they're talking about is that people who were at one time middle class, who because of a number of economic changes in the structure of their country or their town or their community, find themselves struggling more and more. And this is what the Yellow Vest movement is all about in France. Um, it's not just about a tax on, on petrol, although that tax on petrol symbolized how difficult it was becoming for rural people to move around in France particularly since that remarkable surge in, in oil prices from 1911 to 2015. We have with social media and, and more technological gadgets than we can count, this growing sense of paranoia and fear among ordinary people about the future. I would not say it is totally misguided. We have used cheap energy for 100 years to construct more and more complexity in our society. And uh, this is sometimes known as the complexity en energy spiral. 
The problem with this spiral, it's like a staircase, is that we've reached the point at which we can no longer manage all of the complexity that we have built with cheap energy. And things are becoming, are unraveled. Then we have this new added addition, and which I, I talk about in my points, is that the quality of energy that we are now extracting and exploiting has changed. It is more extreme, it is more difficult, um, it has uh, a vastly greater environmental impact. Um, and, and one of the most, so I'm talking about <coughs> fracking of, of tin oil in the United States, I'm talking about the extraction of heavy crude uh, from the oil sands, uh, I'm talking about the you know, incredibly expensive exploitation of oil in, in the ocean. And um, what we need to remember about all of this is that it, it is part of a huge system. The largest man-made system on Earth in terms of pipelines and wells and refineries has been constructed by the oil and gas industry over the last 100 years. It is worth about $25 trillion. But it is, quantit it, it, is, it is now struggling because um, it is not making the same kind of revenue it made with cheap oil. And in fact, the entire fracking industry in the United States, the majority of companies involved in fracking are spending more capital than they are earning from tight oil. I don't know how much longer that can go on. And I would say it's also true in Canada. Then, of course, we have this phenomenon of climate change. Right? We've burned all these cheap fossil fuels to provide all the conveniences we enjoy, and now we have destabilized <coughs> the atmosphere. And we still do not have a plan to deal with this. And politicians are reluctant to deal with it, because the only credible way to deal with it is to slow the economy down. If you slow the economy down, which is powered and fueled by fossil fuels, then you will be using less energy, and if you are using less energy, then your economy will not be growing. And that scenario terrifies just about every politician I've ever met. Another thing to, to think about and, and uh, I think is that we can't imagine a future that was not different than yesterday or the last decade or the last 20 years. And I've got this graph up here just to remind you that what is unusual is the phenomenon of economic growth. For most of human history, this phenomenon did not, of exponential growth did not exist. And it is only when we started to hit fossil fuels that we began to see this extraordinary phenomenon change the shape of the planet and our lives in it. And Robert Gordon, who is a rather amazing uh, American economist, puts it this way. There was virtually no economic growth before 1750, suggesting that the rapid progress made over the past 250 years could well be a unique episode in human history rather than a guarantee of endless future advance at the same rate. And I think he's completely right. So in sum, when you look at the whole global picture on the various trends uh, uh, afoot, uh, we live in a revolutionary period. <coughs> and we can begin to see the beginnings of many of these revolutionary movements. And we can begin to see people everywhere abandoning political parties because they don't trust them anymore, because they behave like cartels. And so we're going to see series after series of populist movements all over the world, some of them left-wing, some of them right-wing, um, but all of them disgusted with the way things are. All right. Now to another story. Peter Lockheed. You know, one of the, the great political statesmen of Canada and one of the great premiers of Alberta um, 
he had about six principles that he developed over his years of uh, developing initially the, the oil sands in Alberta um, that he felt were really important for any resource jurisdiction. And they're very plain, they're very simple, they're very conservative, and yet not one government, either federal or provincial, has used these as guidelines. So his first principle was number one, behave like an owner. Number two, add value to the resource. He made sure that when he was premier, you know, no, no mine or project went ahead unless there was an upgrader or an, uh, a refinery to process and add value to that resource. Um, his other principle were, number, you know, collect your fair share. Make sure that your royalties are controlling the pace of growth and not the other way around. Fourth, he said, save for a rainy day. This is, these are finite resources. You will not see these resources again. You must save the money from these resources for future generations. Clean up the mess. Didn't think you should be leaving an environmental mess behind for other generations. And his last point um, was, um,
Ralph Klein was running around North America saying, come to Alberta, we've got energy to burn. And, uh, and his one comment was, well, well, shouldn't it be some thought, some strategy and planning about this? He said, no, no, no planning. That would be interventionist. And we sent Murray Smith down to Austin, Texas, who gave this presentation in 2006. And I show this just to show you the thinking that was going on uh, you know, 15 years ago. It's important to understand that thinking because it, this is, it, it brought us to where we are today. So, um, you know, it basically he came down with a message saying, you know, we're, we're going to save the United States. The United States is running out of oil, and we're going to save your asses. And here's your oil supply south of the border, and look where it's going. It's heading south. Um, and uh, meanwhile, the fracking revolution had already started in the United States. Right? It started around 2000. You know, had the Alberta government had a strategic brain in its head, it would have begun to figure out, oh, wait a moment, this curve, curve could very well reverse and go the other direction, which is exactly what it indeed did. But anyway, Murray, being a very cheerful fellow, didn't want to introduce any bad news to his presentation. He said, look, guys, you're running out. We've got the answer. Uh, the oil sands will replace depletion and fuel economic growth, and all will be well. And then he said this, you know, the model that has worked so well for us is that the world destruction of oil sands is we give <coughs> it away at 1% and share the risk of these great ventures and great investments. I mean, he used the line, give it away. Well, uh, you know, if you're giving it away, look who's going to play it. All right, so everybody came to Alberta and said, all right, if you're giving it away, guys, we're going to set up operation here. Even though this is really extreme, difficult stuff to work with, it takes a long time to get it on, uh, you know, uh, out of the ground, and it comes with all kinds of, of, of problems, price volatility being one of them. Um, so, but everyone came to play. And oil sands production started to grow like, like toxic over, over time. I mean, I, there, there wasn't one project that the Alberta Energy Regulator, or it was then called the Energy Utility Board, didn't said no to. They just approval, approval, approval. With no thought about, <coughs> you know, is it possible to over approve this stuff? Yes, of course it is. Um, the U.S. Council on Foreign Affairs looked at, it, or looked at what was going on in Canada and said, wow, guys, Alberta has relatively low royalty and tax rates for the oil sands, which promotes greater production. What are you going to do with that greater production? Are you going to upgrade it, refine it, or are you just going to stick it in a pipeline and send it somewhere? There was no national discussion about that. All right, and then, you know, over time, it becomes this, this, this huge, uh, big project. It becomes Canada's economic engine. And then 2008, the financial collapse comes along, and Alberta, has, you know, goes through one of its boom and busts, uh, from which it emerges uh, in the same eager state it entered the boom. And, uh, you know, and this is Alberta during the boom, right? <laughs> And this is Alberta after the boom, <laughs> and uh, every oil and gas jurisdiction in the world behaves exactly the same way. You know, we, um, and but as Alberta became more and more dependent on this this uh, heavy crude, it, it really became more and more of a petrostate in the sense that 30 percent of the revenue uh, generated by oil and gas in Alberta was essentially running the government of Alberta. And uh, petrostates, the first thing they do is they lower taxes. They want everyone to make it feel warm and fuzzy about living in a petrostate, so they lower your taxes, and they start running on petrodollars. The problem with that is that if you're not being taxed, you're not going to be represented. You go from being a citizen to a subject. Then, you know, as everyone, anyone who's, who's looked at Alberta or lived in Alberta over the last 30 years, chronic overspending. You know, Alberta has a spending problem as much as it has a revenue collection problem. Um, this massive concentration of power, um, which is common to almost all federal states, the centralizing of power, uh, either into one political party, um, and then incompetent statecraft. When you're sitting on a hot pile of hydrocarbons, you begin to think extraordinary things about yourself. 
Um, even though you had nothing to do with that pile of hydrocarbons. I mean, they, they were there. You were lucky enough for them to be there. But you know what? It doesn't give you superpowers or super intelligence. But the solution to every problem in a petro state is, well, just spend money on it. And, and, and you, you, know, you go to countries that practice real statecraft, and they are countries that have dealt with scarcity. Uh, scarcity. So, you know, Finland would be a good case of a, of, a, of, a, of a government that runs on taxes from people and has become very evolved at how it uses those taxes. And then, you know, here's the, the tax thing, Alberta Advantage, no sales tax, lowest this, lowest that, you know, and the boasting about this phenomenon goes on and on. You know what? In Saudi Arabia, they don't pay any taxes either. Um, and, and then this claim that, oh, you know, if you're not paying taxes, don't worry because the oil and gas re revenue from collected from the industry is going to build your hospitals and schools and roads. But Albertans were never asked if they wanted one industry and one resource to be solely responsible for their roads, schools, and hospitals. And then you have this amazing phenomenon. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I thought, my God, I'm, you know, I lived 30 years in Alberta. And, uh, and I kept on thinking that, you know, one party rules this place. And how did they do it? They did it on the basis of oil revenue. And what does Terry Lynn Carl, one of the foremost political scientists on oil, have to say about that? High levels of dependence on oil rents have always tended to reinforce the regime in power. There are times when that changes, and we'll be getting to that very soon. Chapter 2, some warnings about junk crude and price volatility. Um, the first, Carl Clark. You know, when, uh, this guy was a brilliant uh, uh, guy. He discovered how to separate bitumen from the sand by using his wife's washing machine. And I'm sure he got a lecture about that one day. And uh, uh, he, he recognized that this heavy crude was not a high quality resource. And he said, look, this is a second line of defense against dwindling oil supplies. And if you have to run on this resource for long, you're going to regret it. So in the 2007 Royalty Review, um, it was pointed out that vitamin always sells at a discount because it costs more to transport and because it costs more to refine <coughs> because it is uh, a junk crude. In other words, you, you have to dilute it with another petroleum product called condensate in order to make it move through a pipeline. Um, and the ratio was one third condensate to two thirds um, bitumen in order to move it through a pipeline, which is why you need so many pipelines to move this resource if you do not upgrade and refine it. And they said, you know, this is messy. Bitumen prices are 63% more volatile than West Texas Intermediate, typified by large price drops and recoveries. This is 2007, they're pointing this out. And they go on to add, price volatility for bitumen is the most obvious risk for the province. This, of course, is a revenue risk for the resource owner, for every Albertan. Ind the, the, the risk is not the same for industry. Industry can buy a refinery. Industry can secure long-term pipeline contracts. Industry can hedge, or industry can store the product. All right, so the warnings were there. Nobody paid any attention to them. Um, you want to create a bottleneck? Spray the lake in the Keystone XL. You're immediately tying up 590,000 barrels of oil. That's how fragile this whole system is. Then you've got the, uh, another warning from the uh, Energy Resources Conservation Board, you know, the Alberta Energy Regulator, and back in 2009. Uh, and what are they saying? You know, well, um, why are differentials between vision and Alberta light medium are due to short-term increases in the supply of vitamin without an increase to the refinery capacity that can process this crude in North America. And then they said, 
There are currently three vitamin upgrading sites in Alberta with seven additional upgraders and a number of debottling and expansion projects planned during the forecast period. What happened to those upgraders and refineries? They were never built. Alberta opted instead for the pipeline option. We'll export this stuff, we'll dilute it, and we'll send it south. Because, as Murray Smith thought, oil in the United States was in a state of rapid depletion. So, we're now on the roller coaster. Um, and the United States, with fracking, you know, starts to produce an enormous amount of tight oil in North Dakota, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, but it's a treadmill. These shale deposits deplete very quickly, and you're only producing if you keep on fracking, and that fracking is enormously expensive, and many, many companies are, are their bottom lines are the worst you can find in the oil patch these days. Spend, 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 earning nothing. But then we see this, you know, increasing oil price volatility, which affects vitamin and heavy crude much more than the other crudes. Um, here's a CDI industry really, you know, explaining that what's obvious, you have volatile revenues, you're going to have volatile government expenditures and volatile shortages and volatile problems running your government. Um, and the Tories certainly encountered all of that. The wealthiest province in Confederation couldn't play its bloody, bill, bloody bills after the 2008 price collapse, which was due to the global financial collapse, which nobody, of course, had prepared or planned for. Um, and then this growing carbon liability is still in the picture. Nobody wants to admit that this product is dirty. It's not like conventional crude. It just comes with a heavier cloud of carbon uh, floating over it. So, you know, Alberta finds itself in the likely position of producing this resource at a very rapid pace and, and finding that it cannot pay its own bills. Um, and this all leads to basically a political crisis in 2013, 2014, where uh, the, the governing party of Alberta, the Tories, are beginning to look more and more incompetent. And the only time you ever see change in a petrol state is when oil prices fall. And that's kind of like drawing the curtain back and you begin to see the emperor's got no clothes on and you're saying, holy smokes, we didn't save for a rainy day, we didn't collect our fair share, uh, we didn't behave like an owner, uh, we didn't go slow, we didn't add value, and now we're paying the price. And it all, everyone can see it for a moment. Another huge price collapse, which uh, Alberta and, and the United States increased production precipitates. You know, it went from 112 bucks a barrel to 48 bucks a barrel. And uh, here's uh, a slide from Art Berman in Houston. Um, explaining how a rapid increase in supply from the United States and Canada precipitated the 2014 uh, crash. And then you can see what happened in terms of the glut of oil in the marketplace afterwards. You know, anyone who worked in the patch in Alberta and Saskatchewan paid a heavy price for overproduction. And so did the government of Alberta in terms of revenues, down next to nothing. Periods of low oil prices offer the best opportunity for change. And that's when Rachel Notley gets elected. It's not because Albertans, you know, suddenly all became new Democrats overnight, God forbid. Um, they, they voted for the NDPs solely because they were pissed off. And they didn't like the attitude of the Tories, and they thought, you know, you guys, you have behaved like a bunch of entitled uh, nincompoops who are incapable of running the government. <laughs> and so for a brief instant, uh, Albertans went crazy and voted in the new, the new Democrats. It was only a brief instant. 
And then the New Democrats found themselves in exactly the same situation as the Tories. My God, we can't pay our bills. Um, and they also ignore this rather fundamental business lesson uh, presented by the Fort McMurray fire, which shut in a million barrels a day of production. And what happened to the price of Western Canadian slut? It rose by 50% from $26 to $42. That, to me, was a really good sign that we were on the road to overproduction. Meanwhile, other you know things are taking place. HS, uh, the, uh, the bank, HSBC, and, and other financial providers uh, said, "Look, we're pulling out of this. We're, we're not funding anything in the oil sands. We consider it too risky. Too risky because of price issues. Too risky because of carbon liabilities. Uh, and, and too issue too too risky because of, of the global movement towards." putting some kind of cap on fossil fuel emissions. And then the, the whole organization of the oil sands changed <coughs> overnight. So Statoil left, and Total left, and uh, most of the multinationals left, the Chinese stayed, um, and uh, basically you're left with five players today that produce 80% of all the heavy crude in Auburn. There's Suncor, CMRL, Imperial, Husky, and Sonovas. Suncor remains one of the most profitable companies in Canada throughout this whole mess, as has Imperial and has had Husky. Why? It doesn't matter what the price of oil is to these guys. They own upgraders and refineries. So if they lose on the price, uh, at one end, they gain at the other. So there's another lesson that the Alberta government really ignored. If you're producing a low value resource and you're not adding value and you start entering a period of incredible price volatility, you are going to lose and lose again if you are not adding value to that resource. You know, and then we get cut up in this whole pipeline media. You know, everyone all of a sudden thinks that the solution to all of our problems to overproduction he has to build more pipelines to get uh, more low-grade bitumen to more markets with the consequence that we'll drive the price down even further. You give us a chance, Canadians will do that. We'll destroy the market for heavy crude. Because we haven't got a strategic brain in our head at this point in time. You know, the Russians have a brain. They figure, okay, if we need to stop production to keep the price at a, at a level that will give us an affordable return, we'll do that. Saudis. They will do that. The Americans are actually having some of the, almost exactly the same problems we're having in Alberta. All right? Too many wells being drilled in the Permian all at once. Um, wild discounts for tight oil down there. They don't have enough pipelines to get it to the refineries. They don't even have enough refineries to handle tight oil. As with the refineries on the U.S. Gulf Coast are designed for heavy crude. But we have this pipeline um, debate going on, and Alberta's got to blame somebody for all of the bad decisions they've made over the last 15 years, and so it becomes British Columbia. You know, and uh, we're not going to drink your wine, we're not going to do this, we're, you know, and, you know, really, it, it was both humorous, yet as a Canadian, I found it uh, quite dispirited. I've never seen this level of, of animosity before in the country. Um, over an issue like this. All right, so let's quickly go through another chapter. This is a chapter about the Koch brothers, and they have something to tell Canada as well about the nature of vitamin and how you make money from it. So these two billionaires uh, uh, are quite notorious in the United States, uh, very wealthy. Their, their father started out building refineries for Joseph Stalin in Russia, believe it or not. Uh, and when those refineries were confiscated by Joseph Stalin, um, their father became a member of the John Birch Society in the United States. Um, they inherited what was left of their father's industries and turned it into one of the largest um, 
uh, enterprises in the United States, and they know exactly what to do with heavy crude. And so they have a refinery in Minnesota called Pine Bend, which processes about 300,000 barrels of heavy crude from, from the oil sands every day. And uh, uh, the Koch brothers buy cheap because this is a low-grade resource. It's refinery feedstock. It's cheap refinery feedstock. Um, they get it from Canada. They can't believe how lucky they are to get it. So, and and they, they process and upgrade the resource into jet fuel and gas, and they sell at rent prices. They buy at Western Canadian select prices, and they sell at rent prices, and they've made a killing. So a discount, uh, a price discount for a bit of an of 15 gives creates a $2 billion worth of windfall profits for the coke industry every year. So these guys know what they're doing. They know how to make a dollar from a Canadian resource that Canadians can't be bothered enough about to upgrade and refine. Here's Charles Coke. Without Pine Bend, Coke Industries would be a different company. We'd be a much smaller and less successful company. He's absolutely right about that. And without Pine Bend, uh, and Canadian Bitman, the Koch brothers, could not have founded the Tea Party movement in the United States and could not be intervening in American politics at the, on the scale they are uh, on almost every subject you can think of. These guys are libertarians and they think they should be running the United States. That's the funny thing about billionaires. Billionaires have always had this kind of psychosis, right? They think, geez, I've made all this money, therefore I must be, tell, be able to tell everyone else how to live. But they did get this right. They get this thing right about adding value. You can sell vitamin cheap, or you can upgrade it into synthetic crude oil and sell it for more, or you can even sell refined products and sell it even higher prices. And that's where we're going in Canada in terms of the export of diluted raw vitamin. And of course, we have entirely <coughs> gone and lost this opportunity here to add wealth to the resource. Now we come to the pipeline uh, kind of debate. <coughs> Got Kinder Morgan proposes the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And it's actually, the pipeline has already it's been there uh, since 1953. Um, and was running about 300,000 barrels uh, through that line. Uh, by the way, when that pipeline was built to Vancouver, Vancouver had four refineries processing oil, uh, and as a result of this pipeline, all four shut down. And um, so Kinder Morgan took over the, the pipeline about a decade ago, uh, bought out another company. Kinder Morgan, by the way, is, is uh, a offshoot of Enron, uh, in Texas, um, uh, Richard Kinder, who's the CEO, was a billionaire uh, and a funder of the Republican Party in Texas. And uh, so they were kicking around this idea of why don't we expand this pipeline and, uh, and see where things go. Meanwhile, Wall Street analysts were looking at this company and how it behaved in the United States, just a big pipeline company. Uh, it's a capital-intensive, cyclical conglomerate with low to no growth and over-leveraged balance sheet. That's where they were being described by Wall Street analysts. Anyway, so they had this proposal for this expansion. You know, get it to the West Coast, and then from the West Coast to Asia, and won't this be grand? Won't, won't Canadians make lots and lots of money in the process? Meanwhile, their debt load is getting higher and higher and higher. So the project is on the books. The hearings begin before the National Energy Board, um, the, at which, and, and during those hearings, you know, Kinder Morgan says, look, Kinder Morgan Canada, sort of our subsidiary, is going to fund all of this. They've got the money to do it, so don't worry about the money. The money's all there. Uh, but in 2014, they restructured uh, to deal with some of this debt, and they no longer had that money. Um, and so what they did was they arranged to get $5 billion to build the pipeline from Canadian banks but they were short $2 billion. And uh, they, they never did get funding for that additional $2 billion. So they were in a bind. They thought, okay, we've got this project. You know, event, it's, it's, it's almost been approved, um, but by God, we haven't got the money to build it. 
Um, so they go to the Alberta government and they say, guys, you want to buy a pipeline? And Premier Allison Redford says, nope, we don't want to buy a pipeline. That doesn't sound like a good deal to us. That's how desperate Kinder Morgan was at that point. They could not find the money. But they found a, a federal government instead that was willing to bail them out. So as soon as Justin Trudeau declared the Trans Mountain Pipeline as infrastructure in the national interest, the folks down in Texas were breaking out the champagne bottles and saying, we can hold this guy over a barrel and we'll do that and we'll get the hell out of this project, which we can't afford to build. And, um, and, not only that, and, and they got a great deal. I mean, the Canadian government paid uh, about two and a half billion more for, for the, 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 the old pipeline than what it's worth. And so one morning we wake up uh, thinking, oh my gosh, we own a pipeline. What's this about? But we, you know, but we don't, we haven't expanded the pipeline, we just own the bloody pipeline. Meanwhile, what had been proposed essentially is a $5 billion project and then a $7 billion project is now, you know, a $9 billion project. So, We've all heard the ads, we've all heard the claims, the Trans Mountain Expansion Project will reap 73 billion in revenues over a 20 year period by raising the price of oil in Western Canada. And you think, wow, this is great. Any pipeline that could do that, how could you be against a pipeline that could perform that magic financial feat? And so where do those numbers come from? Well, surprise, they come from Kinder Morgan. <laughs> That's the only source for these figures. That and the conference board, which use the same numbers. <clears throat> so I went back and I looked at this report. And I said, okay, and this is the report, the only report submitted to the National Energy Board to justify the economics of the pipe. And who was it written by? This guy by the name of Neil Ernst. And uh, so he's a petroleum engineer. I take note of the fact that he is not an economist. And yet he's writing a report on the financial benefits of a pipeline. All right, and so what does he say in this report? He says, well, here's a couple assumptions, but we'll make all this money provided all this holds out. No other pipelines will be built for 20 years. Okay, all right. Um, we'll have 100 uh, bucks a, a barrel for oil. Well, we know that, that doesn't hold water. Um, Increased vitamin supply will result in higher prices in Asia and confound the law of supply and demand. <laughs> Canadian dollar on par with the US. Well, that's a joke. Um, and that, you know, we're, we'll, we'll see this tremendous price uplift because all heavy oil in, in Canada is subject to discount in North America, which also isn't true. Maybe a third of heavy oil is subject to price discount. This was a fatally flawed report. And in pure and simple terms, it was complete bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> and what surprised me was that the National Energy Board did not ask for a sound economic assessment on the realities of building a pipeline and actually accessing markets in Asia. And if those prices that, you know, Ernst were talking about were actually real or, or a fiction of his imagination. So here's his scenario in his report saying, look where oil prices are going to go. Have they gone that way? Nope. And then we have, you know, in, in, in British Columbia every day, which is where I now live, um, you know, we're getting, you know, this kind of propaganda from Alberta, saying the Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project is our chance to foster new relationships in the global market and to get a higher price for our oil. Well, here's the reality. Mexican heavy crude does not get a higher price in Asian markets. Never will, never has. In fact, uh, you get four to five dollars less. So there's no price uplift for heavy crude in Asia. Where's the market for heavy crude? Whether you like it or not, the market for heavy crude is in North America, the largest 
market for heavy crude in the world remains the U.S. Gulf Coast. That's where we get a premium for heavy crude. And we'll get more of a premium at the moment as Venezuelan heavy crude supplies and Mexican heavy crude supplies are in steep decline. <coughs> then we have more propaganda saying, you know, it means supporting what matters. You know, this project is going to help, our, help us build roads, schools, and hospitals. <laughs> All right, if that's the case, then, you know, what are Royal Sands royalties doing for us right now? Where are they going? <coughs> What's happening? Here's Dave Hughes, probably perhaps the most important energy analyst in the country. Um, used to be with the unconventional gas supply in Alberta. Um, he's mapped most coal fields in Western Canada. Uh, used to work for Natural Resources Canada for more than 30 years. Um, he's an absolute, absolutely brilliant guy, and he's all about numbers. That's all Dave is about, is data, data, and data. So, using data provided from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, he mapped uh, the royalty streams in Canada from 2000 to 2017. We start at uh, you know, around 16.1 million in the year 2000, is what we made from all oil and gas across the country. Um, and by 2017, we're down to 6.6 .6 billion. Even though at that same time period, we have doubled oil sands production. We're exporting more, and we're earning less. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like the correct math. You know, somebody has screwed up. And you can see this in uh, Saskatchewan's revenues from oil and gas. Same trend, earning less and less and less as both a function of uh, uh, volatile prices and also a function of government policy that keeps on lowering royalties. Now, what about this price discount? That, you know, all bitumen in, in Canada is price discounted. Well, you know, the World Bank will tell you that's not true. That's not the case. You know, here, here's the breakout for oil quality in Western Canada. You know, you've got light and medium, and you've got heavy crude, um, and none of them are equal. But half of the production, light and synthetic oil, is not selling at a discount. Point. Two five million barrels a day of heavy crude oil, and but not all of that is selling at a discount either. If you're Imperial, you've got the refineries and your upgraders, so no discount. If you're Husky, no discount. Suncor, you're not worried about price differentials. And here's the evidence: minimizing exposure to wide differentials in markets. Suncor, they've been doing that for years. They're experts at it. They know what they're doing. And here's Suncor CEO saying, really speaking the truth. Um, what's happening is the market is working. The higher cost producers are having to pull back because they are not making any margin on their last barrel. We're not in that circumstance. They plan to head. They're adding value. They're making money. And the same thing goes uh, with Husky. The same thing goes to Imperial Oil. Looking ahead in the current challenging upstream price environment, we are uniquely positioned to benefit from widening light crude differentials. Thank you very much. <laughs> Meanwhile, Rachel Notley is going around saying, you know, but there's still that market in Asia. We're going to tap that market. The reality is that there is now and will always be a pretty substantial market for vitamin in the Asia Pacific. At the same time she was making that comment, the her own government released this report. Bidman partial upgrading, white paper. What do they say? None of the Asian countries are well positioned to process Alberta heavy crude as well as PAT3, the US Gulf Coast. And who's making a killing on, on Canadian crude these days? US refiners. <coughs> before I wrap up here. Um, there is a, a really, really big issue 
in the patch, and it has to do with the growing liabilities of abandoned wells, uh, inactive wells, abandoned pipelines, uh, old infrastructure. Um, and it is immense opportunity to get people in the patch back to work doing meaningful and needed things. And the scale of the liability was uh, laid out by this fellow from the National Energy, uh, Alberta Energy Regulator, last year in a presentation he made to the Petroleum Historical Society in Alberta. Uh, he said, look, we've got a $260 billion liability. And he broke it down. Most of it's in the oil sands. You know, what are you going to do with all those plants? What are you going to do with all those tailings ponds? You know, that's 130 billion. And we've only collected about a billion to clean that stuff up. So that's a problem. What about in terms of inactive wells? About 200,000 in Alberta, you know, close to 60,000 I think here in Saskatchewan, uh, another 20,000 in BC. Um, <coughs> But he's only using the, you know, the Alberta data. $100 billion worth of liabilities in well sites alone that need to be properly sealed, abandoned, and reclaimed. And then pipelines. There are 400,000 kilometers of pipelines. The largest kind of, of, of land disturbance in Alberta is from pipelines. Well, it'll cost $30 billion to clean those up. The problem here is that there's the liabilities, $260 billion. And what has the Alberta government collected from industry over the years when it was making really good money? 1.6 billion. So who's going to clean up this mess? Is it going to be left with taxpayers? <coughs> or an industry that's now struggling? This is a massive, massive political and economic problem that could very well uh, affect the credit rating of Alberta. And he laid out, here are the problems. Inadequate liability funding, no targets, no thresholds. Funding only is collected when companies are near bankruptcy. What could be possibly wrong with that system? Um, you know, uh, I, really, the whole program is designed to fail, and it has failed. You could put tens of thousands of people back to work cleaning up this mess. How you fund it is another issue. Uh, and I would suggest that you fund it uh, by raising vitamin royalties. And um, anyway, that's a sense of, that gives you a sense of the scale of the problem in Alberta. And you've got an idea of the scale of the problem in Saskatchewan. Then you've got the tailings ponds. They cleaning them up alone are about a $24 billion liability over time. And the mine sites are another $21 billion liability. And of course, nothing has been saved to do that. So this brings me basically to the end of my, my pipeline storytelling. Um, and let me end with a few points. So last year, the International Energy Agency came out with a report um, about oil producing states and oil price volatility. And they said, look, here's the outlook, guys. Long report, 90 pages. And uh, I don't think the Canadian government has read it. I don't think Rachel Notley has read it. Um, I doubt your premier has read it, but he should. Pitfalls for oil exporters. Here they are. The energy system is changing. It's in transition. Um, it's not trans. It's, it's really not changing very quickly, but it's changing enough that it is making prices more volatile. That price volatility is increasing. If oil prices settle, that is between the $60 and $70 barrel range, net oil and gas income for almost every oil exporting country will never recover to the 2010-2015 levels and lead to a cumulative $7 trillion loss in revenue over the period of 2040. So they're saying, this is a very real possibility and that oil exporting nations should plan for this possibility and act accordingly. All right, you still got Peter Lougheed and his principles. If there was a government courageous enough to adopt them, I mean, I, this man was, you know, a conservative, progressive conservative premier of Alberta. And he came up with 
the most radical plan for dealing with oil money and, 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 and the pace uh, and scale of developing oil. You know, slow down, behave like an owner, save for a rainy day, collect your fair share, add value, clean up the mess. Another option remains adding, of course, more value. You've got all this bitumen. You want to export it raw on pipelines, so you need more pipelines to do that. Or you can upgrade it and get a better price, and you won't need all these damn pipelines. These are just some of the benefits of partial upgrading. There's something about this graph that Canadian politicians do not understand. If you overproduce, you are going to drive down the price of oil. And Canada is now in the position of overproducing and actively driving down the price of oil. I mean, it took a lot of guts for Notley to shut in 300,000 barrels, but you know what? It restored the price. And now that price has stayed relatively high because there's a shortage of heavy crude in the U.S. Gulf Coast due to the crisis in Venezuela and ongoing depletion in Mexico. But everyone should be thinking about this simple chart, the law of supply and demand. A couple of, of oil workers uh, formed this group, Reclaim Alberta. Um, I know one or two of the guys that founded this. And they said, look, let's, let's put all burdens back to work. Let's put people in Saskatchewan and the patch back to work. Let's put them back to work sealing, <coughs> abandoning, and properly reclaiming these wells in the landscape, um, which are potential environmental liabilities for agricultural communities and for groundwater and for the atmosphere in terms of methane leaks. Let's, let's take some bold action on this. This is just a reminder that our economic models these days will give us always a false sense of security. You know, Alberta went the direction it did because it thought the price of oil would only go like this. They never thought it would go down like this and come back up and go down like this again and come back up and go back down. I would still argue that the there is I have not yet seen an economic case for this project. There's no evidence there will be a price uplift in Asia. And yet now taxpayers now own it. You know, if the federal government wanted to do something creative and innovative, it would sell this damn pipeline. I doubt they could sell it. Um, but they invested four and a half billion dollars in it. If they had taken four and a half billion dollars and had gone to Alberta and said, you know what, guys? Enough of the pipelines. Add value to resource. Upgrade it. Here's four and a half billion dollars. Let's use it for partial upgrading and then no more expansion. That's it. And use your resources responsibly and conservatively and save for a rainy day. Of course, that, that's a dream scenario in this country. Then we've got climate change. Again, we know that we cannot address this issue if we keep on exporting oil at the volumes we're exporting. It is impossible to meet any targets. Another way to, I guess, address part of this issue too is, you know, go back at royalties again and recognize that royalties, particularly for three, co three companies in particular, Suncor, Imperial, and, and Husky, we've all figured out the smartest way to produce bitumen is to upgrade and refine it um, and tax those guys a little bit more. This is something everyone needs to do. We all need to go on an energy diet and we're all reluctant to go there. We enjoy our conveniences. That makes us human. My last one. We become civilized only by knowing what to refrain from doing. Thank you.
uh, government inertia. I mean, the whole government uh, policy in Alberta since around 2010 has been more or less, okay, we're not getting these upgraders built, we're not doing this, we're, we're just going for the pipelines. That was the easiest decision to make. It's, and um, it proved to be the most disastrous for Alberta Berlin in, in many different ways. But again, again, you, you need concentrated leadership. Uh, Notley is trying to address this issue in her own way. Um, she is, I think, quite supportive of partial upgrading um, and has set aside $2 billion for a partial upgrade. Question here. Yeah, what percentage of the world's oil reserves are the, you know, light and medium crude, the better quality stuff that's more economically easier to bring out of the ground for use, as compared to the more expensive ones? Um, that's a good question. All I can say, for Canada, 80% of all the crude we export is heavy crude. So what would be, would be like, say, in Venezuela, or say, oh, Saudi Arabia or Iran? Well, every country produces a different quality of crude. So Venezuela is also producing heavy crude. What about, say, Iran? What kind of quality? Um, a variety of oils in Iran. Uh, Saudi Arabia is, produces more conventional oil, but it also produces some heavy oil as well. They're probably one of the world's largest uh, conventional oil or light oil um, producers, as is Russia. Rod? Uh, Andrew, I heard you over the noon hour, but I wonder if you could explain something, if you know something about it. Okay. Uh, I follow First Nations issues closely, and what do you know about the um, Fort Mackay Suncor Agreement and um, the storage tank I had, the role of the Royal Bank of Canada in that, and it has emerged over um, the liquefied natural gas as well as Trans Mountain, where First Nations want to buy into it. <coughs> and behind that is emerging the Royal Bank of Canada. Do you, do you know anything about this uh, movement that's taking place today? No, I do not. Okay. I do not. Financial folks is a good start. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you comment on the situation in Quebec? I mean, you've talked about Alberta, which is a big driver of this industry. Um, but issues of flying to Eastern Canada, so they're going to Venezuela and whatever. Like, how do we, I'm asking a lot of questions, I don't even know where I'm going, but what would be the ideal way to, to create some kind of pan Canadian strategy or policy around the national energy? I mean, we should, certainly we've got 13 jurisdictions, but and it becomes political because then we can reduce the effects. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. No. Good point. So the question is basically about how, you know how, how do we actually get to a national energy strategy that incorporates all of, all of the regions, given that all of the regions in the country have very different needs. Um, and um, let me just talk about Atlantic Canada for for the moment. Okay. So that's the one portion of the country. Um, that is almost completely dependent on imported oil or foreign oil, either from the United States or from the North Sea or from Algeria or someplace like that. Um, because of that dependence, I would say that Atlantic Canada is probably the very first place that we should really speed up the transition. And that we should go to Atlantic Canada and say, guys, I'm sure you've got lots of ideas about how to do this. We're going to help you do this. But we want you to, you know, decrease your dependence on this imported oil, you know, by this amount uh, on a yearly basis. But we're going to let you guys figure out how to do it. So PEI might come up with his own system whereby, you know, it's got windmills. They're actually on well, well on this road. Windmills and a combination of electric cars or something, you know, that's how we're going to do it. Cape Breton, where are you going to do? Nova Scotia, what, are you, what combinations are you going to go for? What, how are you going to change things? Uh, New Brunswick, what would you propose to do? And, and how, can, how do you put a dent in fossil fuel consumption? And let's play. And we're going to make all kinds of mistakes. But let, let's, let's, if we're going to make mistakes, make sure we're not making them in, you know, in the biggest possible places. But where we can bounce back and be resilient and say, wow, that was a, that was a a bummer, a pretty bad idea. 
and not very economic and didn't make us any savings, blah, blah, blah. Right? So we need a strategy to do that in, in Atlantic Canada, the most dependent on foreign oil, first. We know that renewables tend um, to, to be the last things that oil exporting countries really invest in. All right? Saudi Arabia is not an innovator in this field, uh, nor is Russia, uh, nor is Iran or Iraq uh, and all the other oil exporting countries. I mean, that's, that's not, you know, they make their money from oil and they're very reluctant to go any other way. Uh, but places that are, you know, must import their oil have made great strides. Whether we're talking Germany, Denmark, Spain, um, um, they've all started to make the transition. So let's give Atlantic Canada the tools and the ideas they need to start making this transition. Let's start to slow down these projects here in, in Western Canada and, and begin to clean up the mess here. Um, I think that's the beginning of a national program. The carbon tax, you know, um, it's become such a divisive thing. Um, I'm not convinced it's actually going to deliver the goods it needs to deliver. And what we just need are, are more pointed regulations. Uh, we probably need to tax the hell out of monster homes, monster cars, and people who are flying more than five times a year. You know? Um, I, I was uh, wondering uh, if you could explain how it happens that. Uh, the massive uh, uh, fracking that's going on in the United States uh, and continuing losses uh, by the people that are doing the fracking. <coughs> what economic dynamics are driving this process? Cheap credit. Yeah, cheap credit has really been the, the major driver, and that's beginning to evaporate. <coughs> what are they doing? Do they that, uh, that in time, somehow there's going to be a shift? Are they dreaming the same way that people in Alberta are dreaming? Yeah, exactly. I mean, what does what every, every oil man dream of? He dreams of the prices to go back up, right? You know, when you're screwed and you're bankrupt, and what do you pray for? You pray for higher oil prices. Yeah. How comparable was Pierre Trudeau's national energy program in the Norway program in the last three years? Oh, that is a good question, and... All right, so we nationalized, we, we, we created an oil company, PetroCanada, so that we'd have a window on the oil and gas industry so that we could really tell what was going on in terms of expenditures and revenues and, and, uh, and how the money was being created and how it flowed. Um, the Norwegians created Statoil um, so that they could actually do the same thing. Um, other than that, that's probably the only similarity <coughs> Um, the, the Norwegians really came up with a comprehensive plan. They said we're going to have the best and, and tightest environmental regulations for, for ocean drilling. Um, we're going to save the money 100% of it, not 30% as long as you did, but 100%. The government will not run on oil revenues, the government will run on taxes. Um, therefore, the government will be accountable to its citizens. Its citizens will not become subjects to a resource. Um, yeah. And, and then there was a whole bunch of bad stuff in the National Energy Program. Um, you know, that uh, uh, wasn't terribly astute. So we have Pierre Lockheed. He was, had a very sound plan in some of life on how well was supposed to be managed in Alberta. Yeah. So why did it go so off every Alberta throughout the line? Like, why did it become like this wide open wild gas electric oil. Did he learn anything from you? Why he's the white? You know, I bet mean, that's a great great question. Um, so why didn't uh, uh, Ralph Klein learn anything from Peter Lockheed? Uh, by the time Ralph Klein got into power, uh, I mean Lockheed had been out of power for about 58 years. And his legacy had already been eroded and forgotten. And, um, and one of the very first things that Klein did was to dismantle the royalty department in, uh, in the government. Uh, Lockheed thought it was important to have a royalty department that could give the government figures independent of industry. 
First thing the client did was get rid of that department. He said, no, I just want the industry to give me the figures. Um, so why did Klein do that? Uh, Klein was a populist politician who served the industry and the wealthy in Alberta. That's what he did. And his legacy is, has been disastrous for the province. And then when you add on top of that that he was an alcoholic, and you know anybody knows what an alcoholic can do to a family, just think about what an alcoholic can do to a province. Your slide on the energy diets. Well, the carbon tax actually is one of the most effective ways to send a price signal to help us achieve that energy diet. I mean, it's administratively simple and effective to apply. My concern is also with your slide on the law of supply and demand. Well, what about the law of supply and demand of air? So, this quote that you're standing below right now how do we get our petro state to actually not be a petro state anymore? What within your research and its overproduction of elites? How can we actually, how can what you have researched enable us to actually eliminate the production of fossil fuels? Because that is how we become civilized in the sense of climate change and the future generations, the current generations, really. Well, I think the first thing we have to recognize is that um, the process of getting off fossil fuels, which is an addiction, it's an economic and political addiction. Uh, it's going to take an enormous amount of work and will, and will be terribly traumatic. I don't, you know, I mean, everything is connected to oil. Ever since I've been reporting on this industry, I've always, you know, go back to the, the, the figures on primary energy supply for the globe. And it started out, and when I started writing, it was around 86% was coming from oil. Um, and coal and gas. What is it today? Well, we're down to around 82 or 83 percent. That's over the last 30 years. Um, we, we needed to be closer to 60 percent nearly a decade ago. So we have to remember, we have to, to, to recognize that, you know, there's a lot of inertia in the system that Renewables are not comparable to fossil fuels. It's different quality, capacity, density of energy. And they come with their own challenges. Um, and this is not utopia. These are simply forms of energy that you need fossil fuels to construct and build um, that, that will lower carbon emissions over time. Um, Petrostates would the only, there's only one way to get rid of a petrostate, and that's what's happening to Venezuela right now. They implode and they collapse. That's the only way you get rid of a petrostate. Are there any more questions? Last one. Just a question. Does BC import a bunch of oil? Yeah. BC, a, a lot of oil that goes on the Trans Mountain Pipeline ends up going to the to refineries in Ana Cortez, and and then is sold back to folks in Vancouver. Um, BC produces an enormous amount of condensate, which we send to Alberta so that it can be used to dilute bitumen to go through pipelines. <laughs> um, about I think nearly about 20 percent of, of the condensate that Alberta uses is coming from BC. Um, and it's all from the really basically one deposit, the Montmain Basin, uh, which is very condensate rich. And, and it's, that's the only resource that companies make money with at this point in time. They're not making money producing that thing. Roger, the last question. Yeah, I'd like to know how you see the role of inherent First Nations rights on the whole transition and the change and the, the way to move forward. Oh, good question. Um, because I live in BC, I have I, I get to see on a regular basis um, how First Nations have played a really critical role uh, in the province politically in in questioning the Trans Mountain pipeline. Uh, I think there is this idea in Alberta that you know there's this kind of cabal of U.S. funded environmentalists that are holding up the pipeline. 
um, when in fact it is truly First Nations that have been on the front lines from the very beginning. Um, and, and that the protest has been a First Nations, directed by First Nations people. So if you went down to Burnaby, um, where the pipeline and the terminals, the expansion will all be located, um, and if you were to to go there, and, and, and you, you would be greeted by First Nations people, they would tell you what is acceptable protest and what is not acceptable protest. They would tell you the laws the elders have set down. They would tell you how to be respectful. Um, they would, if you were planning to get arrested, they would tell you how to prepare yourself and your heart to be arrested. Um, and, and what I saw, and I was down there several times, was this enormous leadership of First Nation youth from all across the country. Lakota, Cree, Dene, Salish people. Um, it, 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 amazing. This has become a political education camp for First Nations people right on the front lines in, in Burnaby. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of things that could stop uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline, but to me, it will, it will always be the First Nation protest that has played the most important role in reminding Canada, uh, both politically, morally, and economically, that things must change. <laughs>